So we've grown over the last couple thousand years to really enjoy the flavors and aromas that oak wood imparts into wine and the other processes of enrichment that maturation in oak barrels bring to wine. But we've also pointed out that barrels are super expensive. <laughs> so how does a small or medium sized winery pull this off? If you don't have enough money to float buying $1,600 brand new French Limousin barrels every year. Well, because we like the flavor so much, people have figured out alternatives to using barrels that still give you the same flavors. Barrels are really no longer economically viable for inexpensive wines. And maybe this is something you've already thought about. I keep using the example of Yellowtail from Australia, Australian Shiraz, which has oaky vanilla flavors out the wazoo. And the stuff costs like three bucks. And it comes from Australia. So at some point you gotta say, wait a minute, this stuff's so cheap and it's so much oak flavor in here. How on earth are they pulling that off? They're not, they're doing some other things, all right? So if we are considering wineries that are using standard oak barrels, our standard 225 liter Bordeaux barrel or barrique, and they're gonna do it legitimate old school way, here are the economics of it. That 225 liter Bordeaux barrique will fill 300 bottles. Barrels are usually only used three times. As I've mentioned before, they're neutral, they're played out, and they're thrown out. Let's say each batch goes for 12 to 24 months. Either way, whether you age it for you know 12 months or 24 months, if once you've gone through three cycles, you have three batches of 300 bottles. This is for each barrel, okay? Let's pretend, just so the math is easy, Let's pretend that you paid $900 for each barrel. And now you have three cycles of barrel use that's produced 300 bottles each. That's 900 bottles. So for a $900 barrel, which is cheap, it's starting to be cheap in today's world, $900 for the barrel to produce 900 bottles. So at the end of the day, when you go to the store to buy that bottle of wine, Simply having it in the barrel for 12 to 24 months has added $1 of cost to each single bottle produced. Okay, maybe some of you say, so what? And? You know what, that's fine. That's fine if you have a hundred, if your bottle cost a hundred dollars, then whoop de do One dollar, you know, in that cost is no big deal to you. You're still gonna make $99. Even a $20 wine, even a $25 wine, no, $1 additional cost in our production for barrel aging is worth it because we're making 20 to 25 bucks. They can absorb that cost. Let's bring back our $3 yellowtail. If you oak age that in a $900 barrel, that would mean one out of the $3 has gone to barrel aging and that is unsustainable. There's no way. That means that the other $2, you've made all of the wine, gotten bought all the grapes, done all the processing, all the shippings for $2, and you're still making a profit because one of those is barrels? No. No way. Can't be done for inexpensive wines. And I, I'm picking on Yellowtail, but I would say really any wines under 10 bucks, that is, oh, adding $1 to their cost is a significant economic hardship. You just can't turn a profit. So how do you get cheap wines that have oak flavors and particularly vanillin and the other woody stuff that we like? You cheat. <laughs> now, I, I hopefully no winemakers, cheap winemakers are gonna watch this. Why would they? Uh, but I'm going to offend them now because yes, they cheat because they're using a, a barrel alternative. And it's not technically cheating everywhere, although different countries have different laws. I'm pretty sure the French have a law that would prevent you from using alternatives. The French have a law for everything when it comes to wine, so I'm gonna assume that they would outlaw barrel alternatives. I'll check into it later. 
But let's just get to the alternatives. How do you make your wine taste like oak when it's not been in a barrel? Okay. Well, for our standard barrel aging, we've been talking about this whole time. We're going to take, you know, 225 liters of wine, and we're going to put it inside of a wooden container. I think you've followed me so far this entire series. What if instead you take apart the barrel and stick the barrel into a vat of wine? Huh. Well, that was, that's cool. That works. And in fact, it works better. What? What? How can that be? Well, if you're simply trying to get the oak flavors out of that wood, putting the fluid into a barrel is actually ineffective. And it goes back to that surface area, the ratio of the liquid that's touching the actual wood. When you put that amount of liquid into a barrel, think about visually in your head, picture a barrel. Where is the liquid touching? It's only touching the inside. Look at the whole outside of the barrel. The whole outside of the barrel is not touching anything. So the whole outside of the barrel is not being used. So it's actually logical and a better use of the wood simply to get wood extract, to take apart the barrel, take apart all the staves, and stick them into 225 liters of wine because that's actually increasing your surface area contact. And for those of you that still aren't following me, I mean, we, th pretend like this is a stave, right? If this is a stave on the end, this is the inside of a wine barrel, the liquid's only touching this side, not that one. So by taking apart all the staves and dipping them into the fluid, now both sides are being in contact with the wine as well as that side and this side and that side. You've radically increased the surface area that's touching wine or that wine is leaching uh, the wood elements out of. Clever, right? But why stop there? I mean, yeah, that's there's more surface area being touched if I stick this into wine, but what happens if I split this in half? Oh, if I took a stave of uh, I took a standard barrel stave and I cut it in half, oh, now I've introduced two new edges. I just increased the surface area again. Why well, stop there? Why did I split it up 20 times? Why did I take a chunk of wood and split it into sheets that are paper thin and stick them into the wine? Is that increasing surface area contact? Absolutely it is. And in fact, if you think about it, take it to its logical conclusion, how can you get the most amount of surface contact between the wood and the wine, pulverize the wood into splinters. Make it into mulch and throw it all in the wine. You know what? Pound it into dust. Put it into a pencil sharpener and shave it up to dust and throw all the dust in there. Now that sounds preposterous and stupid and corny and completely impossible, but it's actually done. <laughs> you thought I was just making this stuff up. Yes, you can do all of these things. You could put staves down into a, a vat of wine. And actually, you could hook it up like a ceiling fan and you mechanize it and have them swirl around like beaters, all right? Making cookie dough. Uh, and the, you will have wildly increased surface area being contacted with the wine, but in moving it, you're even uh, um, accelerating the contact with the wood and the wine, okay? You could cut it up into chips, into little squares, into mulch. And you, again, think about using uh, all these descriptions I'm talking about. Pretend I'm using the same tree or the, the same amount of wood that would go into a barrel, but I'm cutting it in different ways. And so the same amount of wood, but cut up into smaller pieces and done different things with. If I cut it into staves, that's increased surface area. If I cut it into chips, into blocks, into cubes, increased surface area. I cut it up into mulch, into dust, increased surface area. And you can throw all this stuff into a vat of wine to get wood extract out of it. So staves, slices of wood, chips, I call it mulch, uh, but even dust. But you know what, do you really wanna throw pencil shavings or wood that's been pulverized into dust into your you know, million gallon batch of wine in a stainless steel tank? Uh, no, because then it's all dirty and you got all this junk in there. So what could we, how could we get the dust in, how could we get our oak dust, our oak chips in there without muddying it all up? Oh, how about you put it into a, a bag of some sort, like a 
teabag. That's what they call it. You can actually teabag wine, and the Australians are big into this. So you can take the same amount of wood that you'd make into 10 oak barrels, pulverize it into dust, put it into a giant tea bag, and dip it down into your gigantic 10, you know, a, a million gallon St. Lucille tank of Australian Shiraz. And you will extract out a bunch of the wood elements that you now know because we've been talking about it for an hour or two. That's how you do Yellowtail. All right, you can't possibly put those billions of bottles worth of wine that they produce every year into oak barrels. The price would be astronomical. But you can chop up some wood. In fact, you can go over to the barrel makers and buy the sawdust out of their lumber yard and put it in a tea bag and get many of the same flavors and aromas at a fraction of the cost. A small fraction of the cost of putting that same volume of wine into oak barrels. Make sense? Okay. Then why doesn't everybody do that? There are downsides. Uh, a lot of us don't like the idea of our Shiraz being teabagged, for starters. And hopefully you've already filled in your sexual innuendo joke every time I've said the word teabag. I had to have students explain that to me five years ago. Sorry, I'm a little slow. So, uh, but I didn't make up the terms. Australians did. And so, you know, most, a lot of us, kind of sore types, we're a little bothered by that. We're like, well, that, that's not the traditional way. So there's something to be said for tradition. Um, and the Australians would be quick to point out, they're big experimenters. And they're the ones that invented the screw cap and the boxed wine. And the, the Australians would be the first ones to point out, hey, you all said screw caps were stupid and dumb and not traditional, but now everybody uses screw caps. That's true. And they would say, and everybody said that boxed wine was stupid, a dumb idea, but it's actually a superior uh, enclosure device, keeps wine fresher longer, and it's up, you could put good wine in that. And that's true. And both of those wine innovations have actually taken off, been embraced now in the last decade, are being used all over the world. The teabagging thing, though, I would call into question, as well as many winemakers do and wine, many wine drinkers do which is that you are losing something. It's not exactly the same. If we were talking about simply the f flavors and aromas of wood, if we were talking solely about vanilla, the smell of oak, of cedar, of pencil shape, it, when we're talking about those descriptors, then yes, you can cheaply, through these alternative uh, processes, extract out those chemicals and those flavors. You can do it. But what other things have we been talking about with barrel aging, with maturation? Is that all we've talked about? Is just simply wood flavors and vanilla? No, we've talked about a lot more. We've talked about a process that takes three months to tw two years because of the breathing of the wine, because of the evaporation, because of the concentration that occurs in a barrel. You, and you can't fake that with teabagging. Remember, you have oxygen that's introduced, it softens it. You have extracts that are over time going more slowly into the wine and integrating in different ways, both chemically, but also the ways we can detect with our nose and our palates and you simply can't fake it all the time. So you can get some elements out of barrel alternatives, but you can't get them all. And therefore, you know, the classic traditional winemakers would say, well, no, no, we're not using staves or chips or dust or tea. We're not doing any of that stuff because you can't do what we do with two to six years of barrel aging our Barolo. And that's a true statement, too. <laughs> There's something to be said for things that take time. Much the same way that barrel making itself can't be faked. They haven't figured out a way to machine make it, to fake it. To, you have to have people that know the art and craft and have done it for years or decades to produce this certain product that can't be faked. And the same can be said about the wines that are put in it, especially say big red wines that are done for an extended period of time. But speaking of an extended period of time, I've talked perhaps way more than any other human about barrels. So let me wrap it up 
with a barrel conclusion, and that's next.